Good morning. One of the biggest challenges I have when I come to KBF is not knowing to look to the right or to the left, right? So I'm going to try to do my best to be unbiased. And uh, once I get less attention, I do apologize ahead of time. So, uh, well, uh, I would like to invite us to open today um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read from verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 was 1 to 4. In fact, let me just focus in on um, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 5. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 5 is what I want to focus on. And I'll read this. And when I conclude verse 5, I will say this is the word of the Lord and I hope that you can reply Thanks be to God. You can always tell whether it's an Anglican crowd or a Lutheran crowd or Baptist. Uh, Anglicans and Lutherans will know what to do at this point, right? Baptists, we usually go amen, right? So, uh, so I'll, I'll read this. I'll say this is the word of the Lord, and you will say, thanks be to God. Shall we do that? Okay. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 5. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Let's look to God in prayer. God, we ask even as we come to this text where we look at the gospel itself, we pray that you'll open up our hearts and open up our minds to realize that the only way we are made right before you is by Jesus. Show us the cross in all of its beauty and draw our hearts. Bring out from our hearts, we pray, faith. We may put our faith in your gospel as you have asked us to do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start with a question. Um, did Abraham, and talk about the people of the Old Testament, did people like Abraham believe in the gospel? Did they have the scriptures with them? Did they believe that in the gospel in the way we do? Yes or no? What do you think? Did he, did he have scriptures teaching him the gospel? Did he believe that, you know, for example, in Calvary, did he believe that, you know, Jesus would die and be raised again on the third day? Did he believe all that? Well, most of you said no. I don't think anyone said yes. But what if I, let me take you to Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Let's, let's go to Galatians 3, 8. I want to read Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. It says here, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. That's verse 7. Those of faith are sons of Abraham. To which I ask you, what faith? If Abraham believed in one thing and we believe in another, then we are not of the same faith. But the question is, did Abraham believe what we believe? Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So let me ask this question. What preached the gospel to Abraham? Let's try that again. What preached the gospel to Abraham? Some of you just don't want to say it. It's like, it, it, it doesn't sound right. Does it say scripture? Scripture preached the gospel to Abraham. Well, what is the gospel? We just read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. 
and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day and so the question is did Abraham believe the gospel because we have scripture in Galatians telling us that the scripture already preached these things to Abraham that would be remarkable wouldn't it if we could show that Abraham actually believed the exact same things that Christians believed because we are told all the time hey the Jews Christianity is a departure from Judaism that the Jews believe this about God and Christians believe something else but what if we were to show that it is actually Judaism that is a departure from what Abraham believed what if we could show that Abraham actually believed in the gospel and when we say scripture what do we mean we're going to be looking at that in the second session but scripture is here being used interchangeably with God's word when God speaks it is scripture did Abraham have a written form of God's words I think so how when God spoke to him he must have scribbled something down that which he scribbled down is scripture and so you're going to realize it's going to challenge a lot of what we think about scripture because we think scripture only began with Moses but that's not what scripture says can someone read for us Romans chapter 9 verse 17 Romans chapter 9 verse 17 So scripture says to Pharaoh, notice, did Mo Pharaoh have scripture with him? Well, if God spoke to Moses and Moses would have written down something to Pharaoh, that which Moses wrote down to Pharaoh is scripture. If God spoke to Abraham and he wrote something down, that which Abraham wrote is scripture. And it's the scripture, what God revealed to Abraham about the gospel that preached the gospel to Abraham so much so that we can say we are children of Abraham in the same faith in other words Abraham believed the exact same thing we believed now all that sounds nice and well to put out there the question is can you prove it can you prove that Abraham believed in Calvary can you prove that Abraham believed that the Messiah will die for his sins and on the third day be raised from the dead well for that we go to Genesis 22 I want to focus on Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 to 2 there's a lot to say here Genesis 22 verse 1 says after these things God tested Abraham and said to him Abraham and he said here I am and verse 2 says Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, the first three words is important. After these things. Look at the person next to you and say, after these things. After these things, right? What things? Well, we know Abraham lived a life of faith, right? Can I get an amen to that? Did Abraham live a life of faith? Did Abraham live a life of obedience to God's word? Well, very obedient to God's word. In fact, so obedient that when God told him in Genesis chapter 12 to leave your family and go to the land I will show you, leave your father's house, what did Abraham do? He brought Lot with him. Uh, well, that's not quite really obedience now, is it? God told him, leave your father's household. He brought Lot with him. And we know, we know how the story of Lot went. Lot, uh, his, his house got burnt up in Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife became Ajinamoto, pillar of salt. His children commit, his daughters committed incest with him. His son-in-laws became toasted in, in the flames of Sodom and Gomorrah. And 
That didn't, that didn't end too well for Lot. And if you had to ask Lot, what are some life lessons that you can give to us today? Do you know what Lot would have said? Don't follow Abraham. Look at my life. Well, well, that's just maybe one incident. But mostly Abraham was good, right? So he went to the land, except that when he was going to the land, the story goes that there was a famine where Abraham was going. And Abraham is supposed to be the man of faith, right? And what does a man of faith do when there's famine? He makes a U-turn and makes a run to Egypt. That's what it says. Goes to Egypt, and in Egypt that year, there was a competition. It was the husband of the year contest in Egypt. And Abraham, we know, was nominated as husband of the year, right? Because when he's going to Egypt, he says to his wife, Sarah, you're very beautiful. When the Egyptians find out you're my wife, they're going to kill me and take you. So in order to solve this, Abraham came up with a brilliant idea. Just tell them you're my sister. That way they just take you and they, they, live, they leave me alone. In that sense, Abraham was husband of the year. Right? Imagine telling your wife that. Or just tell them you're my sister. That way you can go. And so true enough, when Abraham arrives in Egypt, they do find her beautiful. And she does what her husband tells her to do. In fact, so well known as a beauty that actually it's the Egyptian king, the pharaoh, the, the, the Egyptian monarch that actually took interest to her. And so she is now being taken to the king to be one of his concubines. And as she's being taken away, if you had to ask Sarah some life lessons, what do you think she would have said? Don't follow Abraham. Don't trust Abraham. Now we know from the story that the king took her, but before anything could happen, God brought plague into the king's family. And that king must have been to God like, hey, what did I do? Like, I mean, listen, he said that's his sister. And so if you had to ask the king, what lessons could you give for us? He would say the same thing. Don't trust Abraham. I nearly got killed because of this man telling me that's his sister. And so God intervenes, brings plagues to the king, and eventually Sarah gets set free, and they go on their way. In fact, Pharaoh gives Abraham a lot of things and just says, take it and go. And now Abraham is doing well off. And then you know, we all know the story of how Hagar and Ishmael came about. Abraham went and had a relationship with his wife's maid upon his wife's request. And as a result of that, produced a son by the name of Ishmael, who many of the Ara Arabs or the Arabs today consider their father. And Ishmael, we know, was, was having a tough life. In fact, they, they, Ishmael and Hagar, his mother, were driven to the wilderness where they nearly died. And so if you had to ask Hagar and Ishmael, what are some things you can tell us about Abraham? You get the same mantra all over again. Just don't trust Abraham. We're nearly dead because of him. And so you get the idea that the life of Abraham, when I said earlier, was a man of faith, man of obedience. Uh, not quite. Abraham was a sinner. He sinned. And when you see the word after these things, keep all of that in mind. After these things, God tested Abraham. We've kind of, I know I've ruined Sunday school lessons for a lot of us today. We, was like sun, we colored picture of Abraham's in Sunday school. We said, this is a man you want to emulate when you grow up. You know, to be like Abraham was what our Sunday school teachers taught us. Well, maybe not. But after these things, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am, verse 2. He says to him, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Now here's the question I have. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. In fact, Isaac was not the older son. Yes, that's right. It's, the oldest one was Ishmael. We all know the song, Father Abraham had many sons. 
then why does the Bible seem to be making what can only look to be an obvious error? Your only son, Isaac. Well, here's where we need to realize that something is going on. When God said, your only son, Isaac, God actually had a different son in mind. The point of this story is this, that God is now saying to Abraham, you've lived a life of sin, and if you want to be in a right relationship with me, your son must die. That's it. You want to be in a right relationship with me? I'm holy. The only way you come before me is that your son dies for your sins. And it's not just any son. It must be your only son whom you love. And now you begin to realize that that phrase, your only son whom you love, was the identical phrase we find where? In the New Testament. The baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus where the father looks at the son and says, you are my son whom I love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. So when we look at this, we realize that God's message to Abraham is that if you want to be in a right relationship with me, I'm not going to tolerate any of your sins. I'm a holy God. The only way you and I are in good terms is your son must die for your sins. Herein lies the gospel already in Genesis chapter 22. And it's not just that your only son must die but where must he die? Let's go to the next one. He must die in Moriah. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. Now, we know that Abraham was somewhere in Beersheba when this was taking place. So Abraham is somewhere in Beersheba, and he has to journey all the way north to a city called Jebus, where Moriah is. And that's where he's going to have to give his son, Isaac. Now, wouldn't it be interesting if the Bible actually told us where Moriah is? But it does. Moriah is mentioned one other place in the Bible. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read 2 Chronicles. Maybe someone can read for us. 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Thank you. So where is Mount Moriah? Jerusalem on the, the, the very place of the Temple Mount itself, where the temple in Jerusalem is. No wonder in Jerusalem, uh, no wonder in the New Testament do we find Jesus constantly saying, we need to go to Jerusalem. We need to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because that is the place that God appointed for the Messiah to die. That's where the son of Abraham must be offered. Can't be offered anywhere. He must be offered on Moriah. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll realize, let's just highlight a few things that have been going on here. Next one. We know, number one, that Abraham sinned. And we know, number two, that God reveals that his son must die for his sins in order for Abraham to have a good relationship with God. And number three, the death of Abraham's son will take place on Mount Moriah, that is Jerusalem. Now I want you to look at this picture right here because you see this mount, that temple mount here, you see that, and you will see right outside that same mount is a small hill right here, which is called Golgotha. 
Calvary. Little did Abraham know, but God was actually telling him that your, your only son must die in Calvary. And you have Calvary right there in Genesis chapter 22. Remember I said the city is called Jebus? Jebus was the old name for the city which eventually got renamed Jerusalem. David conquered the Jebusites, renamed it Jerusalem. So, here we have in Genesis 22, we're just in first two verses, by God's grace, we're seeing that God is already revealing these three things. But it's just getting started. We're just getting started. Let's go to verse uh, 4 and 5. In fact, I want to focus on verse 5. On the third day, verse 4 and 5, huh? on the third day, as it was three. So Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Let's stop here. Look at what Abraham just told his men. He's come to the place and he says to his men, you stay here. I and the boys are going to go over there. We're going to worship and we will come back to you. And the question I have for us is this. Was Abraham telling the truth or was he lying? What do you think? Lying? Well, if, he's, if you say lying, I'm can totally understand that because Abraham hasn't been very forthright all throughout. You know, we know that you know, he tends to say a lie here and there. His wife would have known that. But on this occasion, I don't think that Abraham was lying. And neither do I think Abraham knew what was going to happen. All I think that took place is that Abraham did a little bit of calculation. Because prior to this, in Genesis 15, God had already prom promised a son to Abraham. And later God told him, it is through Isaac that your promises will come. Through Isaac, your offspring will be named. So let's do this mental arithmetic that Abraham would have done. Number one, God told me that Isaac must die for my sins. Correct? Number two, God also told me that Isaac is the one through whom the promises come. That means what? Isaac will die because God said, but what happens after Isaac dies? After he dies for my sins, he comes back from the dead. Now, I didn't say this, by the way. This is in Scripture. Gen uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19. Hebrews chapter 11, let's go to the next slide, verse 17 to 19. And this is what it says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up... What, son? Hebrews does the same thing. Notice he didn't correct the mistake. It's intentional. Offering up his only son. Of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. By the way, the word only son here is the Greek word monogenes, which is the same word used in John 3.16. Exact same word, monogenes. Begotten, only begotten is the King James translation, and I think that's probably the best way to translate this. The Greek literally says, offering up his only begotten son. Verse 18, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Verse 19. It's telling us what Abraham was thinking. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In other words, Abraham did the math. Isaac will die for my sins, but then after he dies for my sins, he'll come back to life again. And that's why he tells the man, I and the boy will go and worship and we will come back from you. He is presupposing a resurrection in Jerusalem. 
Now, here's the other question I have. The text says, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back, which means he did come back to the dead. But how? Because God pronounced a death sentence on Isaac on the first day. God pronounced a death sentence on Isaac. And when Abraham went on Mount Moriah to offer the sacrifice, figuratively speaking, he received him back from the dead. Here's my question. On what day did Abraham receive him back? Since the day that God pronounced the death sentence. On what day did Abraham receive him back? Genesis, next slide, chapter 22, verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So on what day did Abraham arrive to offer the sacrifice? Three days' journey on the third day. So on what day, according to Scripture, figuratively speaking, did Abraham receive him back? On the third day. So you have right there, Plenty of things already in place. You've got that this, God is saying to Abraham, your son must die for your sins. You have that the son will die in Jerusalem. And now you already have the son will be raised on the third day. Already there in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 to 5. But we're just getting started. I want to read verse 6. Verse 6 says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son. He took in his hands the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. What was Isaac carrying as he walked up that hill? He's carrying wood. And we can summarize all that we've said so far. Next slide. Just like Jesus carries the wood up that hill 2,000 years later, Isaac is carrying the wood up that hill. So we have Abraham sinned, number one. Number two, God reveals that his son will die for his sin, his only son whom he loves. Number three, death, death will take place on Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah, which is where we know Calvary is. Number four, as Isaac goes up the hill, God shows Abraham a picture of Jesus carrying the wood up on that. So Isaac carries the wood in the same way that Jesus would carry the wood. And number five, the son will be raised on the third day. All of this right there. Let's move on. Go to verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on top of the altar, on top of of the wood. So Isaac has just carried the wood up. When he reaches the top, Isaac is fastened to the wood. Just like Jesus, when he's carried the wood up that hill, will too be fastened on the wood. You have an exact parallel between Jesus and Isaac. And mind you, this is taking place some 2,000 years before Jesus died. 2,000 years before Jesus died. This is a story that even Muslims commemorate. Hari Raya Kurban, Idil Adha, is about this event where they will kill the bulls, they will kill the cows to commemorate this event. Of course, they have a different story for this, but it's still the same figure of Abraham and his son. But in the scriptures, we find the gospel is being revealed through this. When Isaac carries the wood on the top, verse 9, he's fastened to the wood and he's about to die. Verse 10, Abraham reaches out his hand. And Abraham reaches out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord, verse 11, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Verse 12, he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. Catch this. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now I know you fear God. What is the meaning of that? Now I know that you fear God. It means all this while. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell all this while. You know. no, I, don't, I don't want to but read it that badly. But I just found it interesting that the language is now I know. What 
Why is it that it says now alone? Because I think all this while Abraham has lived a life that may be described as somewhat faithless. There's a bit of faith here. There is faith here. But it is life of disobedience, a life of sin, partial obedience, and many cases faithlessness. But he comes to this place where he trusts in the promises of God. And God says to him, don't touch that child. That's not the son who needs to die. So what is the son that needs to die? Verse 13. And this is an important verse. Let's go to verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold him. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham on that mount on Calvary, he looks behind and he sees that ram that is caught. And he realized that the one that is to die for the sins, Abraham's sins, and mind you, ours too, is the Lamb of God. God will provide that lamb. Now, how would you know what is the giveaway that this is the lamb of God to die for the sins? Do you see where the lamb is caught? Do you see where the ram is caught? The head of that ram is caught in the thicket, which means, right, what, what do you see around the ram's head? Thorns, branches, wood. Sounds fam looks familiar. That is why I think it is so profound that when Jesus dies, there's a crown of thorns on his head. It almost is a throwback, a flashback to where Abraham found that ram. When he found a ram, that horn was in the bushes, was in the branches, was in the thorns. I don't think the Bible authors put that there to show us how sadistic the Romans were. I think there's a prophetic trajectory that is going on here. And so when you look at this, you even have a picture of how the ram looks like. And Abraham went and took that ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. The reason that children of Abraham, you and I, don't have to die for our sins is because of the Lamb of God that comes to die in our place. Now, here we come to the final big question. Did... Abraham believed that that story was done and dusted before this. Sorry, before this, uh, did Abraham believe that that story was done, or did Abraham believe that this was a foreshadow of the future? Future. Why? Verse fourteen. So Abraham called the name of that place. The Lord will provide. Notice it's not in the past tense. The Lord has provided. It is in the future the Lord will provide. And here Moses, who is the author of this, there's a very interesting side note. He gives us a very interesting footnote or commentary. Moses tells us, as it is said to this day. How many days is that? Well, approximately 400 years. <laughs> but 400 years later, almost half a millennium later, Moses is saying, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Future tense. Which means, Abraham didn't just believe this was a one-time event of the past. Abraham believed that this would take place in the future and communicated that to the generations that will communicate it to the next generations that will communicate it to the next generations. Watch out for that mountain. It's on that mountain. It will be provided. Wow. The gospel was being preached by Abraham. The gospel was being declared. The only way a sinful person is made right before God is not by trusting in their own works. It's not by doing good. It's by trusting in the blood of the Lamb of God that was offered on Calvary. That's what Abraham believed. But you say the Jews don't believe it. Then they have departed from the teachings of Abraham. Because Abraham's descendants knew this. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the, the thing is, the important thing is this. That Do you know that Abraham's descendants in Egypt, 400 years they were in Egypt. They have never seen that mountain. They have never been there. Moses has never been there. 
It's not as if that was a local mountain that they all used to go to, and so there's a local superstition going on that, oh, on that mountain, something interesting is going to take place. No, they've never been to that mountain. They've never seen that mountain. They were in Egypt, the tip of North Africa. It was in a different continent. And they were saying, you watch out for that mountain. That mountain is the one, the place where it will be provided. What will be provided? The provision for our sins, the Lamb of God. And so, when we summarize this whole thing, let's, next slide, please. Here's what we see Abraham sinned. God revealed that his son will die for his sins. Number three, the death of that son will take place on Calvary, on Moriah, in Jerusalem. The son carries the wood up that hill, and after dying for the sins, number five, the son will be raised from the dead on the third day. What are some applications for this? Well, let me just sum, tie this to three thoughts. Number one, all of us have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. We have sinned in our thoughts. We have sinned in our words, the unkind words that we speak, the evil thoughts that we have the actions that we do, motivated by selfishness, motivated by greed, motivated by lust, motivated by lots of things. We have sinned in every sense of that word. And the question is, how would a good God, as holy as the God of the Bible, accept a sinner like me? How will he accept the sinner? On one grounds and one grounds alone, the son of Abraham died and rose again. I have nothing else. I can give nothing else. But that Jesus died and that he died for me. That is my grounds of confidence. You ask me, Sam, when you go to heaven, how confident will you be that you can go to heaven one day? I'm very confident. How come? Not because of anything I've done. If I'm asked, why should I be allowed to enter heaven, my only appeal is this, Jesus took my hell for me. Jesus paid for my sins. As the old adage goes, nothing in my hands I bring, only to his cross I cling. That's all I need, nothing else. The accuser, the angel of death will come at the night, but when he sees the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of our hearts, he passes over. He can have no claim on a house where the blood is there. That was Abraham's confidence, that was Moses' confidence, that was Israel's confidence, and by faith, that too is our confidence. We have attained peace with God. Romans 5.1. Can someone read Romans 5.1, please? Of how we attain peace with God. Thank you. Therefore, having been justified by faith, justified meaning that we have been declared righteous, God is holy. He looks at a sinner like me and says, Sam, you are righteous. And I ask, how come? My whole life has been a life of sin. And he says, because Jesus took your sins for you. He died for your sins and he rose again. And because of that, your sins have been washed. You, your righteousness is not your own. It is the righteousness of Jesus. It is on that basis I have peace with God. And so there are people today that are fearful saying, how am I going to make it to heaven? The key is, is our faith rooted in the perfect Savior. That is the Lamb of God. That is Jesus Christ. If our faith is rooted in Him, two things will take place. Number one, we have peace with God in our hearts. Number two, we will see an internal transformation. We will start hating sin. The same sins we once loved, we will start to hate. And the same God that we once hated, we ran away from, we will draw closer and closer to Him day by day. And I think that's the evidence that we have attained. Peace with God through the death of His Son. Glory be to God alone. Let's pray. God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the Gospel. And we thank You for the authenticity of the Scriptures. By this, we know that this book is Your Word. It stands distinct and unique from every other book on the face of the earth because it reveals a God who can dictate the history of humanity. 
2,000 years before it happened, you promised the exact place, the exact means of death, how the death will take place, and the days of resurrection. And so, God, we just want to express our faith. If for whatever reason we had doubts concerning your words, I pray that those doubts be dispelled. I pray that faith may arise in our hearts and that we may cling on to the gospel, the same gospel that Abraham believed in, by faith. And in, by faith, we will find peace with you. By faith, we will find your love, your presence in our lives and transform us to be more like Jesus, to love you more and to hate ungodliness. We ask for your love. We ask for your kindness to surround us, to be with us even as we go through the rest of the day and a session to come. In Jesus' name.